good morning. It's Tammy with Real Southern Woman. I hope y'all are having a good day. It is Wednesday. Um, I actually woke Chris up this morning, so he had to get out of the bed so I could do my Bible, my Bible study. Um, Chris, would you do me a big favor? You probably don't want to. Let me do it, girls. I'm going to close the blinds because all you can see is the glare in my glasses. I don't know why, but I get these glasses that are supposed to be no glare. Does that look like no glare to you? It looks terrible, don't it? It's driving me crazy. I'm actually thinking about going and having that LASIK surgery. I'll be right back. I'm closing the blinds. It's the morning sun. The morning sun. I don't know if y'all be able to see me in the dark. Let's see if I can lighten it a little bit. I might have to switch uh, sides. Lord have mercy. I looked a lot better with the sunshine shining on me. We're going to take Chris's seat. Let's see how this works. Chris sits here. That's better. Um, I woke him up this morning so I could go put on makeup, y'all. Poor Chris. He had to get out of the bed. I've been coming on here every day without my makeup on, and I look terrible. So today I was like, I'm going to put on my makeup, and I know I'm late. But y'all, I know this 8 o'clock thing, for those of y'all who are tuning in to the Bible study, um, I have figured out that the first week or so, the girls will be out the door on time for school. Their school don't start till what, Chris, about 8, 8.35, 8 8.40? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, they were getting there pretty early. Now that they've been in school a few weeks, weeks. They're not in such a hurry. Now, Amy gets out of here early every day, but May lags behind. So really, the Bible study really needs to start probably about 8.15, 8.20-ish for it to make more sense. Now that they're in school and uh, they're for sure getting out the door by then. Hey, Sherry. Um, I hope y'all are having a good day. Y'all tell me who's here this morning. I see that Sherry's here. I got my iPad this morning so y'all could see my book. I had to go get coffee last night. I went by and seen Mama. And she's so sweet. It's amazing how sweet people get when they get older. And a lot of women get meaner as they get older. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, good morning, Donna. But as far as once they get really old, and I shouldn't say this because some of y'all are going to be old. To me, you're not old until you're over like 70. And I think if you make it to age 70 and you're older than 70, then you're pretty old. And for some reason, women do get meaner. Donna's here. It looks like Rose is here. Uh, and Marilyn. Um, but anyway, it's funny because my mother has always been mean. Always. I mean, just, she still is in her own little ways. She's a pessimist, and she's uh, very, um, opinionated. She wants everybody to be beautiful. She thinks that everybody's supposed to get up every day and look like a million bucks, put on their makeup, you know, match up their clothes. She don't think that women over 30 should have long hair. She just... You know, that's just how she is. She's in her 70s. Well, last night the nurse came in, y'all, and Tara has got to be the sweetest thing ever. She is, you know, when, when you put your mom or dad in a home, now she's in a private home, granted, so it's, a, it's, a scale, it's way scaled up compared to a nursing home. But... You know, you get what you get, you don't put your feet as far as the work, the workers go. Because, I mean, they're not getting paid a lot of money. Um, Chris, you know what I wish you'd do? I'm serious. I wish you would lock, open me up where I'm live, because these girls are used to me in the mornings, and let me know um, by my eyes which way is looking straight into this thing, because I've never gotten it right. And Chris never gets it right. With the iPad, it's so confusing. And I want to be able to look at y'all and not be looking, you know, to the left or to the right. So he can help me with that once he turns it on. But anyway, Tara was in a room and um, she was. Tara lost her son two Christmases ago. 
and um, he was 25, and he had a heart condition. He had a lot of physical conditions. But she got to telling us how her and her husband was in the car a few nights ago, and a song came on the radio, and it had God in it and stuff. And she said before her son died, that song was playing, and he was in the back seat of the car when they was riding down the road, and he said... Um, all he wanted was for God to take him to heaven. And I don't really know how mature he was at his age because he did have a lot going on. Um, but she just cried. She said, me and my husband just cried. It was the sweetest thing. And then when she started crying, my mother held out her arms to her and wanted her to give her a hug. And it was just so sweet. And I thought, Mama can be really, really sweet. She's a lot like me. She can be really opinionated and rub people the wrong way, but then she could turn around and be the sweetest person ever in different circumstances. And, I mean, I mean, that's just part, I think, of being a woman. You know, we just, we're just women. Um, let's say, did you ever get it up? Well, let's, sh let's look at it together. You got it open. I am. What I'm having to do is look at the very top, the middle and top of the screen. And I can't see myself when I do it, but I'm actually looking at y'all, I guess. It's so weird. It's just so weird. But anyway, enough of that, I guess. But I was thinking about this this morning. I know I told y'all yesterday, and I hope it didn't offend anybody. And if it did, I'm sorry. But I said that I didn't believe that women should be preachers. And I was thinking this morning, I know y'all probably think, why? And I'm old school. I personally don't think a woman should be president of the United States. And the main reason, and I was a, I was a um, career woman. I mean, I had an architectural degree. And you ask me, why not? And I'll tell you exactly why. Because we're emotional. We're very emotional. And if you're a woman and you won't admit that you're emotional, then you're probably more emotional than everybody else. Because we are very emotional people. Uh, we're emotional when we're young. We're emotional with our cycle. I mean, we, I'm, I, I want to know that when I'm in my cycle, I would just, when I was younger, because I don't have it all the time now, but when I was younger and I had my cycle, oh my gosh, I loved Chris so much, I couldn't get enough of him. Um, but right before my cycle, I could, I could pick him apart, you know. There were so many things about him that, you know, I would get upset about or rub the wrong way. I mean, it really affects a lot more than we give it credit for our personality and the way we think. And the reason that's uh, scary is because uh, I just don't think a woman, as emotional as we are, should be the head of some things. Um, I just don't. And then when we get older and we go through menopause, that's even worse because then we absolutely have no hormones. It affects us physically and mentally. It's just awful. And yes, I do believe that men go through some hormonal changes. I do believe that men have some periods in their life where they're kind of emotional like a woman gets. But it's not near as much as we are. And I'm sorry if y'all disagree, but I, you know what? If you just admit it uh, to yourself, you know it's true. Um, and I mean, you know, you can, you can find yourself yelling at your kids. When you're younger, you're yelling at your kids, and you're like, what is wrong with me? And then two days later, you start your cycle, and you're like, oh, that was what was wrong with me. And I guess y'all, uh, if, if you won't admit it, I guess you think you're perfect. But you know what? We're emotional people. God made us that way on purpose. He made us that way so we could love people, care about people, and nobody can be like a woman. We are all very special. Anyway, uh, with enough of that said, but I was thinking of that today when I was putting on my makeup uh, about me saying that yesterday, and I probably hurt some people's feelings, but I thought, you know what? If we'd all just admit how emotional we really are, um, then we would we could see why it wouldn't be the wisest thing for us to be in some positions. Um, 
Does it mean we're not smart? Absolutely not. We're smart as we can be. I think we're equal in the, in the eyes of God as far as our salvation and what we can do for him, except the fact that I don't think we should be ministers. I do believe that we should teach people all day long. I believe we should be disciples. I think we should tell our kids, our grandkids. I don't think women in general or men in general talk about God near as much as they ought to. I don't think that they put the word of God in their children like they used to. I don't think they ask their children about salvation like they used to. Everybody leaves all that up to the church, and it's not just the church. I mean, just because they go in a building with doors and a, and a roof uh, doesn't mean that's the place they should learn everything because that's a building with doors and a roof. The church is inside of us, and if there's nobody in the church, then we are the church. So um, if y'all have some grandkids, read them a Bible story. Or, or tell them how good God is to you. I tell you what does better than anything. Tell them how good God is to you. Not, you know, Moses took the people out of uh, bondage. You know, I mean, they don't know who Moses is, not really. And they're not in bondage. Tell them how God has, has blessed you and your family. And give God the credit. And then they will see God in their life, in your life. And it will make a difference. Now, we're going to start our Bible lesson. Um, the poetical books of the Bible, real, it's really cool. That's one reason I wanted to use this uh, iPad. Because if you look in uh, your study book, you will see that, and I put the numbers above them, that there's three kind of books in the Old Testament, okay? There's 17 historical books, five poetical books, and 17 prophetical books. Now, Look how nice and in order that is, y'all. Isn't that nice? Now, we finished up the history yesterday. Um, so today we're going to talk about poetical. Now, he goes into a lot of detail that I'm not going to, because I'm going to be honest with you. I was never one that was good at talking about, uh, I'll give you an example, hyperboles and metaphors and similes. No, thank you. I do good to know what a noun and a verb is, okay? And an adjective, that's about as far as I get. Uh, now, my kids are completely different, but I'm just not big. I, I was always the kind of kid that did better at math and science like a boy. So this literature stuff and me don't really jihaw that well, okay? Now, most women really do really good with literature, like, my girls are amazing, have amazing vocabularies, and they do great with literature. But it was just something that I'm more like a man in my mind, I guess. Um, and if and that's just another example, I'll say. If I'm so much like a man, I'm actually like a man in what I was good at in school. Um, I'm like a man when it comes to uh, I'm not sentimental. I don't keep things. I really don't. I don't have keepsakes. I don't hardly have anything from my children when they were little. Um, none of that matters to me. I'm a lot like a man. I am not romantic, not one bit, okay? Um, and if, if I could be the kind of woman that I am and be so much like a man and still be as emotional as I can be at times, that is another, you know, that just goes to show that uh, if any woman was not going to be all that emotional, it would, be, it would have been me because I'm a lot more like a man with my thoughts. Like, I don't remember things that women remember. Like, Mama was a caterer, and we would do so many weddings. We did weddings almost, I'm not kidding, in June, almost every weekend. But we did probably five, I don't know how many weddings a year we did, but we did a lot. I couldn't tell you what colors was in any wedding. I couldn't tell you what colors the bride uh, maids were. I couldn't tell you what colors the bridesmaid were in my own wedding if I didn't have some photos because uh, I don't care. Those things don't matter to me. When I went to a um, wedding, I just didn't pay attention to stuff like that. And Mama made me go to the doctor and the doctor said, Honey, your daughter has a selective memory. That's the memory that a man has. She don't remember anything unless she really cares about it or it really makes an impact on her and um, 
So it just drove my mama crazy. She thought something was wrong with me, and that's why I had to go to the doctor. But anyway, let's let's say I'll quit talking about myself. We all like to talk about ourselves, don't we? <laughs> anyway, the poetical books are wonderful. They're some of my favorite. Uh, for one, because King Solomon wrote three of them, and y'all know how much I love him. Anyway, I think I've always liked people who were wise, or you know, he was supposed to be the wisest man. So I like anything he has to say. I just do. Um, if God says he was the wisest man, I listen to what he has to say. Um, anyway, it says, um, history has come to an end, and the historical books are completed, and the books of poetry of the people of Israel begin. The poetical books are the middle five books of the Old Testament. I showed y'all that. Um, it says that Job was written during the time of the book of Genesis. And that's hard to believe, ain't it? That Job was during the time uh, of the book of Genesis. Of course, the book of Genesis covers a large period of time. Um, it, says, uh, it says that Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon were written during the lifetime of Solomon in the time covered in 1 Kings. Um, and it also says that Psalms was written during the life of David in 2 Samuel, okay? And he shows us a little nice little chart to give us an idea of the history. Let's see if I can get this. If y'all want to do a screenshot, you can later. But it kind of shows you the timeline of these books. But um, then he goes into, he gives us an overview summary for those of y'all that are taking notes. And this is a long summer. He gives us two of them in here. Um, it says, the poetical books fall into three major types of poetry within which the poets used a number of different literary techniques to communicate God's message. That is a long summary, isn't it? The poetical books fall into three major types of poetry, within which the poets used a number of different literary techniques to communicate God's message. And then he tells us there are three major types of poetry. It's One is lyric poetry, L-Y-R-I-C. It says it is to be accompanied by music like a song. Okay, then there's instructional poetry, and it's to teach the principles of living through, and he uses this word, pithy maxims, P-I-T-H-Y maxims, M-A-X-I-M-S. I was like, what in the world does that mean? He can use some, he can use some words in this, can't he, y'all? Pithy means short or brief, if you want to know. And maxim means it's a wise statement. So the instructional, why didn't you just say that, right? So the instructional poetry is to teach principles of living through short or brief wise statements. Don't that sound so much better? Um, then number three is dramatic poetry. It is a narrative that tells a story in poetic form, okay? So you got lyric, instructional, and dramatic poetry, which is, of course, I like that kind. All right, so those are the three major types of Hebrew poetry. You got it? Lyric, instructional, dramatic. It says the two main literary techniques... Techniques are parallelism, parallelism. Is that how you say that, Chris? Yeah. Parallelism? Yeah. And figures of speech. Now, I am not going through all of this because it is complicated. And it's not something that I would ever remember or even care about personally. Now, some of you women are all into literature and way writings are done and all that, so y'all might like all of this, but I'm just going to give you the uh, summary, which is, rather than matching sounds, 
A Hebrew poet is more concerned with matching ideas, a technique called parallelism. P-A-R-A-L-L-E-L-I-S-M. So instead of matching up sounds, they're more interested in matching up ideas, the Hebrew poets, okay? That's called parallelism. Now he goes on into giving you six common forms of parallelism in this book. Um, and I am not going to go through that because I'm just not. Uh, it's too, it's too uh, deep for me. Um, I mean, I like reading the part that's the example, but the rest of it I care about. I'll give you an example of one of them. Climatic parallelism. The second line repeats the first with the exception of the last word or words. The second line repeats the first with the exception of the last word or words. Like, it is not for kings, O oh Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine. And there's six different forms of this, okay? Now, the next one. He gives us a review so that we can fill in the blank for all of those, which I'm not interested in. Then he says, okay, the next one is figures of speech. Creating visual images, okay? The summary definition says, since the Hebrew poets wanted mental pictures to pop into a reader's mind, a prime consideration was creating visual images which they accomplished with vivid figures of speech. That's a lot, isn't it? That's a big summary again. Summary definition. Since the Hebrew poets wanted mental pictures to pop into a reader's mind, a prime consideration was creating visual images. So we're talking about figures of speech creating visual images. Figures of speech creating visual images. It says that the Hebrew po poets wanted mental pictures to pop into your mind, um, and so they would accomplish that with figures of speech, okay? It says that there's five uh, major, the most common figures of speech. There's five, a simile, a metaphor, a hyperbole, a rhetorical question, and a personification. And you probably ain't heard that since you were in school or something. But I'll give you an example of one, metaphor, okay? A comparison in which one thing is said to be another. Example, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. So he's Lord and your shepherd. Okay? While other are figures of speech, these are the most notable ones, it says. Now, um, then we go in. Um, he says you can't get, you, if you can get away from the need to hear a rhyme or rhythm, uh, then you can appreciate Hebrew poetry, okay? There's five poetical books in the Bible. One is Job, two, Psalms, three, Proverbs, four, Ecclesiastes, and five, Song of Solomon. Number one, Job, suffering and God's sovereignty. So you could put that under the five poetical books. To me, this is more uh, what we've been doing. The rest of it was just like icing on the cake to kind of give you an idea of what the, the Hebrew poetry was. But this is more like the meat to me. Okay? So we start with the five poetical books, and we start with Job. And I want you to know it says that it's about suffering and God's sovereignty. That was something I talked about in the, in the lesson late yesterday, how I feel God's over everything, and so many people don't want to believe that he's over the bad things that happen to us. But, you know, that's just life. And um, if, you, if you want God, you've got to take him for what he's worth. I don't think we should just pick and choose what, you know, what we want to believe. God is in control of everything in our life, whether it's good or bad. Uh, we're the ones that make the choices in our life. Uh, the good and bad choices, but then God has to follow up with whether or not <clears throat> he's going to bless us or chastise us or <clears throat> just make us go through something to get close to him. You don't ever know what it's about. 
And if he does something to you to make you get closer to him, it doesn't mean you're not close to him. It may mean that you're cl you could be closer to him than, you know, uh, hundreds of other people, but he wants you to be even closer because things happen to pastors, missionaries. It happens to everybody, not just, you know, ordinary mean people, okay? So you have to believe in God's sovereignty, <clears throat> which is God's plan or will, and that God is over everything, everything. So if you don't get anything out of listening to me, trust me, God's over everything. Because why do I say that? Because God says he is. Because the Bible says he is. <clears throat> He's over the good and the bad. <coughs> so remember that. When you're going through something, know that God has you in his hand. And God's in control, whether it's good or bad. <coughs> Gosh, every time I drink coffee, it makes me so hoarse. Okay, so, though Job's questions are never answered, his willingly, he willingly submits to the sovereignty of God. And his fortunes are restored and doubled. So when God... Uh, told the devil that he could do these things to Job, and Job first started being under all this, uh, I would, can I say scrutiny? I don't think Chris is listening to me. Anyway, um, he um, probably had no idea that years down the road that God was going to uh, bless him so much. Of course, I don't know, he probably did, because he was already blessed, and he believed that God was, you know, everything to him. And, um, but he went through a period where, where it was really hard, it, and especially when he lost his whole family, his wife, and even his health, you know, it was really rough on him and his friends. I mean, could you imagine how lonely he felt? And it just goes to show that he never gave up, okay? Um, but he was restored and even doubled in what God had blessed him with before. So sometimes God puts us through things not because we're bad, but just to show off, just to show off and show the devil that how good God can be, okay? So keep that in mind, too. Number two, Psalms, praise in public worship, okay? Psalms means book of praises. There are three primary types of Psalms. There are praise, thanksgiving, and lament. If you don't know what lament means, L-A-M-E-N-T, it means... Um, sorrow like you have sorrow or you're um like it really means like you're crying you're whining you're really deeply uh sorrowful for something that's happened in your life or maybe even the life of somebody else's so there are three primary types of psalms they're praise thanksgiving and lament okay the proverbs is wisdom skill for living um and this instructional poetry it's instructional um, is written in short, and he uses this word again, uh, pithy maximums, focusing on one's relationship to God and others, like money and morals and speech and industry and honesty. I mean, it would hurt us all to look at a proverb every day, read a different one every day, because they... they the Proverbs are so easy to understand and easy to read, and they uh, are good instruction because the wisest man in the world that ever lived wrote them, <clears throat> okay? Ecclesiastes, it says futility of temporal pursuits. Um, Solomon, with his unlimited resources and opportunity, tries to find the meaning of life through industry, pleasure, wealth, Wisdom and power. He had it all, that's for sure. He finds them all unsatisfying. It says he concludes in this instructional poetry that there is only one that can satisfy man. So if you don't feel satisfied, if something just seems like it's missing, if you're lonely, if you're empty, if something's going on and you just can't understand why, the wisest man in the world that had everything he could want says this. Only one thing can satisfy man, and that is to fear God and keep his commandments. 
so if you're feeling that way, fear God and keep his commandments. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to get in his word and get close to him. Okay? Because the more you get in his word, the more you're going to fear him because the more you're going to know him. And the more of his commandments you're going to know. I mean, if you're new and you, and you haven't read a lot in the Bible, um, I mean, you could start with, I mean, as far as salvation goes, the book of John is the best one. Uh, if you're not saved, you cannot hardly understand the words of the Bible because the words of the Bible are truly spiritual words. And um, when we're not saved, it's hard for us to spiritually discern what we're reading, okay? But when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. And when you read the Word of God, it just opens it up so much more because it is a spiritual book. It's a spiritual writing, okay? So if you feel like every time you open it up, something's just missing, uh, read the book of John first and see if you're saved, okay? And if you're saved, then ask God and his Holy Spirit to help you, okay? But you can pick up Proverbs and get a lot out of it, okay? Even somebody that's not spiritual can read the book of Proverbs and get some wisdom, okay? Then we got the Song of Solomon, which is God's marriage manual. And boy, is it pretty uh, something else. You know, all these women want to watch all these love stories or read these love stories and read this stuff on TV. Well, Song of Solomon is a, is a love story. Uh, God's Marriage Manual. It says, the Song of Solomon is God's Marriage Manual. This dramatic poetry pictures the intimate love relationship between Solomon and his Shulamite bride. In doing so, it represents God's perspective on married love. Then the self-test is really just matching up the description um, of each book in the Bible with what it's supposed to be, okay? This one is, uh, like for instance, one of the books, of the five books, is about wisdom and skill for living. That would be Proverbs, okay? One is God's marriage manual, which is the Song of Solomon. One is praise in public worship. And of and that's the Psalms, because we know a lot of songs and hymns have come out of Psalms, okay? Suffering and God's sovereignty. If you don't want to believe that God is over everything, good and bad, then read the book of Job, okay? And then there's the futility of temporal pursuits. That's Ecclesiastes. Um, I don't know why he gives it such a name like that because that's to me that's hard to understand and I'm educated. Futility of temporal pursuits. Um, all that means is there's one thing that can satisfy man and that is to fear God and his commandments. Okay, that's it today. I've talked forever. I hope y'all had a good lesson. Um, I hope y'all have a good day. Me and Chris have got to start cooking more for CBC. Um, I got that new air fryer, but I can't show y'all a video on it until I'm ready to um, review it. So we're thinking about putting some chicken in it and uh, see, just seeing what it does. I mean, some of y'all got these air fryers, but I'm going to look at the book that came with it. And I'm going to make a few of the recipes in the book. And we'll record them, and I guess I could always post them later. Um, and we'll see how that air fryer works. A lot of y'all have bragged on it to me. This thing that they sent me is big. It holds a lot of stuff. So we really need to get that book out today and, and see if we can't make a few videos. Um, I hope y'all are having a blessed day. Um, I hope that you pick up your Bible and read a little bit today. Try to look at Proverbs or one of the books we talked about today. Uh, at least a little bit. And uh, be blessed. I hope um, that y'all continue to listen. And follow this book. I know it is hard to keep on keeping on sometimes when you get in a study. And I thought when I started this one, a lot of these women may not even want to follow me in a study because sometimes I don't even finish the ones I was on. But it, the ones that I did before, like the angels, the Billy Graham's book on angels, the reason I didn't finish it is because, and I'm not trying to be... But it was just the same stuff over and over, kind of. You know, it was almost like 
um, there was only so much meat in it. The rest of it was just filling, filling in to make a book. And I'm not saying that uh, Billy Graham is not a good writer. I'm just saying there wasn't a whole lot more to learn there. So I just didn't have enough interest in it to finish it. Um, and we got the, we, we hit the highlights, and that's really all we needed to know, that there are angels around us, right? Um, and, but they are not our grandmother or our grandfather like everybody thinks they are. They are angels, beings that God created in the beginning before he even created man. Um, and so many people have a hard time with that because they want the angels to be one of their loved ones when that's just not the way it is. Um, and my cousin said one time, don't you think that an angel can take the form of one of your loved ones? And I said, maybe, you know, if God really, you know, thought he was going to use that, um, maybe, but you know, God normally, um, anytime you've seen an angel in the Bible, there were some that did take forms, and she gave me an example, and let me tell you why she felt this way. She and her husband was riding down the road. This is the same cousin that if we get in the cooking show, she'll be in there with, with us. She said she and her husband was riding down the road, and there was a man laying. There was a man. He was like, I can't remember she said he was laying down. I think she said he was laying down near the road, and he had on overalls. And like a flannel shirt or whatever. And she said that it looked just like somebody they knew. And they were almost positive it was this person they knew. Not even a dead person, but a person they knew. And when they pulled over to check on the person, I think they actually needed help. But it wasn't who they thought it was. Um, and it, once they got up close, they realized it didn't even look like who they thought it was. So they thought maybe an angel was giving them a view or a perspective so they would stop. Um, and she says, do you think that could happen? I said, well, with anything, God, I mean, with God, anything can happen, you know. And um, if it was so important for y'all to stop and take care of this man, yes. I mean, it could have, you know, it could have very well been either God took control of your eyes and made you see something you, could, you didn't think you were seeing, or maybe, you know, maybe an angel did make some kind of form. Who, who knows? Uh, but all these things in our life that we take for granted, that we just look over, God blesses us so much. And uh, only God knows all these deep, deep things. But um, many people want to look for miracles in the world, and they're more interested in miracles than they are in the Word of God. And let me just say the Word of God is the biggest miracle we have. So if you're a miracle seeker, then pick up the book. Okay, um, let's say our prayers. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for today. Thank you for Wednesday, hump day. In the middle of our week, I pray that you bless each and every one of us, um, especially the people who tune in to hear your word in the mornings to learn more about you. I pray that you would uh, bless them and their families as they go throughout the day. Please keep us from temptation and help us be good examples and shining lights for you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Love y'all. Bye. Sandra and Donna and everybody. Love y'all.